वेलकम टू इंडिया स्पेशल आई एम एजाज हैदर टू डेज अगो पाकिस्तानी मीडिया कोटेड फॉरन मिनिस्टर शाह महमूद कुरैशी इज सेंग दैट पाकिस्तान वॉज गोइंग टू इन वॉक द इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट ऑफ जस्टिस ऑन इंडिया रेवोकेशन ऑफ आर्टिकल थ्री सेवेंटी दैट रिपोर्ट वॉज इन करेक्ट वॉट मिस्टर कुरैशी सेड वॉज दैट पाकिस्तान वॉज थिंकिंग ऑफ इन वॉकिंग द यू एंड कोर्ट ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ इंडियाज ह्यूमन राइट्स वायलेशन इन ऑक्यूपाइड एंड नाउ ए नेक्स्ट कस्ट कश्मीर एंड दैट अ डिसीजन हैड बीन टेकन इन प्रिंसिपल इन दैट प्रगार्ड In other words, while Pakistan is thinking about and deliberating on various legal options, including the one Mr. Qureshi spoke about, no final decision has been taken so far. This has also been confirmed by the Information Minister, Dr. Firdaus Ashik Awan, who told the media in a briefing that it has been agreed in principle that the case will be presented with a focus on the violation of human rights and genocide in occupied Kashmir. A panel of lawyers of international repute would be engaged. to pursue the case on behalf of Pakistan at the ICJ today we shall look at what those possibilities are and how effectively they can be invoked against india and that states excesses in indian occupied kashmir also whether it will be prudent to take a big case as in a big leap or take multiple smaller and effective steps to consistently build pressure on india and create a groundswell of international governmental and non governmental opinion against india and in favor of kashmiri's right to self determination here's an example of what can be done a clip on how canada decided fuse visas to indian security forces officers affiliated with the army and other paramilitary outfits let's take a look has hurled the ultimate insult on india's men in uniform no less than two retired lieutenant general three brigadiers and two senior officials of the intelligence bureau have been denied visa on grounds that their organizations were engaged in violence india has taken strong exception to canadian immigration calling the intelligence bureau a terrorist organization new delhi in fact has threatened retaliation if canada does not apologize Lieutenant General Amrit Singh Bahia former Director General Military Operations former Quartermaster General and currently a member of the Armed Forces Tribunal he's been denied a visa to visit Canada reason he once served as a Rashtriya Rifles Sector Commander in Jammu and Kashmir and the Canadian High Commission has said that sector commanders have a hand in the 70000 deaths in the state General Bahias is not an isolated case. Canada has been blatantly hurling insults at India's security establishment. It should be noted that Professor Amartya Sen, an Indian economist and Nobel laureate, in a recent interview to an Indian TV channel has bitterly criticized the Modi government's decision to annex occupied Kashmir. Can Pakistan approach international heavyweights and get them to provide support to the cause of Kashmiris? Here's a clip from Professor Sen's interview. Do you believe the future of Kashmir as has been defined now is the way forward for peace and the restoration of a quality of life for millions in Kashmir? No, I do not believe that. Uh I think Kashmir is a very special problem, but it has certain general features. One of which is that I don't think you would ever have fairness and justice without hearing the voice of the leaders of the people and if you keep the what are thousands of leaders uh, uh under restraint and many of them in 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 jail including big leaders who led the country and had formed government in the past um you're stifling uh the channel of communication that makes democracy a success people over here a lot of people in the government say that uh, the, the the suppression of political voices now was done to ensure that there was no breakdown in law and order how do you respond to that so well, that's always the excuse that's the classic colonial excuse that's how the british run the country for 200 years meanwhile the us president donald trump has again talked about mediating dating between india and pakistan even as the pakistani prime minister imran khan in an interview to the new york times wednesday said that there was no point talking to india pakistan has already downgraded diplomatic links and suspended trade with india following india's move to annex occupied kashmir what exactly can the us do trump would be meeting with modi over the coming weekend at the g7 summit in france 
While India is not part of the grouping, Modi has been invited to the meet by French President Emmanuel Macron. Meanwhile, Genocide Watch has issued a genocide alert with reference to Kashmir. It is deeply ironic that India, which just went through a massive electoral exercise and presents itself as the world's most populous democracy, is top of the genocide watch list with occupied Kashmir and Assam alerts. To discuss these developments, we have us Ambassador Jangir Kazi, a former High Commissioner to India and also Pakistan's Ambassador to the US. Ambassador Kazi also served as head of the UN in Iraq and later under Secretary General Ban Ki Moon as a special representative to the Sudan. With him, we also have Faisal Hussain Nakbi, an eminent lawyer who represented Pakistan in the Baglehar and Kishan Ganga disputes. Mr. Nakbi has also taken the initiative of developing a strategy on countering India's use of pellet guns in occupied Kashmir. Let me kick off with Ambassador Kazi. Ambassador Kazi, uh, what do you think of A, the situation right now? As I said, Genocide Watch has issued an alert for Kashmir. And secondly, uh, this thing about going to the ICJ? Well, this development of uh, Genocide Watch is very significant. And uh, uh, although Nakfi Saab uh, will explain in detail, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the details of uh, approaching the ICJ and the difficulties in getting uh, it to uh, agree to its jurisdiction covering uh, uh, this approach to it, uh, you know, of Pakistan. Um, the fact that uh, Genocide Watch has uh, made uh, this decision uh, uh, is significant because, I mean, I understand there are two kinds of decisions that uh, the ICJ can do. There are advisory opinions uh, and uh, and then there's this contentious uh, dispute, uh, disputes. And uh, I think genocide is, uh, is one of those subjects on which it may not be necessary to get India's consent, but on anything which is about disputes, uh, both uh, uh, parties would have to agree before the ICJ uh, would uh, <clears throat> Agree that its jurisdiction covers, uh, you know, the petition or the approach. Uh, however, I um, uh, will, uh, you know, uh, submit to the judgment of our eminent lawyer here. But I think it's uh, very much looking at it from the diplomatic point of view. This is an important step for Pakistan. Uh, we've been to the United, Secretary, uh, United Nations Security Council. It doesn't really matter whether or not we got the fullest satisfaction there, which we did not. You know, there was no statement that was issued. There was no consensus there. There was no uh, uh, decision as to what would follow. But nonetheless, bringing it to the attention of the UN Secretary, um, uh, Security Council uh, was important. And, there, and incidentally, there's also the UN Secretary General's uh, statement. You know, so these are significant forward movements. We need to do everything that is diplomatically possible to get India to have another look at the decision it's taken. And of course, war can is, is no solution. But war, if if India uh, proves totally adamant, and uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, uh, atrocity, the intensity of the atrocity approaches genocidal levels, we would rightly expect the international community to in intervene very robustly with India because uh, for so let's, Pakistan, let's try, and get, let's try and get that perspective from uh, Mr. Nakwi. Uh, Faisal, uh, what are the options here? Well, uh, the first option which is being considered and is being discussed is the possibility of going to the International Court of Justice um, under its contentious dispute resolution jurisdiction under the Genocide Convention. Uh, that's Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. I think that's 1949. The problem with that approach um, is that India has entered a reservation, which means that when it signed the Genocide Convention, it also attached a rider saying that it would only accept, it would only accept the jurisdiction of the ICJ if all parties to the dispute accepted jurisdiction. Which includes India itself. Which includes India itself. So that makes going to the ICJ under the Genocide Convention uh, somewhat unlikely. The second option which is being considered is that we should go to the ICJ in its advisory jurisdiction and seek an opinion in terms of uh, possibly even the original sin of 1947 onwards, 
uh, India's original occupation, whether that is legal, whether the so-called doc, you know, document of accession is legal, all of those issues can be submitted. That's, uh, if, if that is being considered, procedurally it may be uh, somewhat complicated because you need a, a resolution from one of the UN uh, bodies which are appropriate, Security Council for example, or the UN General Assembly. So you would need to get the vote. Either of these two. Either of these two, there are also other bodies like the Economic and Social Council and certain other bodies for different questions. Okay. But those would be the two most appropriate ones would be either the UNGA or the Security Council. So issue number one is can you get the votes? Issue number two is do you really want to take, I mean taking this entire dispute, it will be factually complicated. We're talking about 70 year old facts and while we are very clear, um, it would be interesting to see how the ICJ would deal with it. The third option, which is something that I had discussed earlier on your show, is to take smaller issues and either take them to the ICJ in its advisory jurisdiction, but even if you can't go directly to the ICJ, then try and develop international consensus on these points. For example, the use of pellet guns. Now, pellet guns, or more accurately, shot guns, are being used by India for crowd control. And I discussed this with a you know, well-known international lawyer yesterday, and he couldn't believe it. He's like, you mean India is using shotguns regularly when policemen are not in danger of their lives? And I was like, yes, there are thousands of people. He's like, well, in that case, it wouldn't be a very complicated issue to look at. So people need to be sensitized. This needs to be brought out on the stage. And what I had suggested was that we should get an opinion from the world's most eminent practitioners of, you know, you could get three or four people to give a joint opinion then present it to the international scholarly community and have a consensus on this issue. They should move forward with that. But the last point that I wanted to uh, make was in relation to, you mentioned the denial of visas to the, uh, by Canada. Now, in the United States, you have something called the Alien Tort Claims Act. And there was a very famous case in 1976, which is the Philatiga case, where a Paraguayan, I think, general who had been responsible for the torture of civilians was sued and this was then subsequently also used in other cases, for example, involving the Marcos family. And if there are people, political leaders, who are directly involved in genocide, because the Alien Tort Claims Act, I think it's 1796, refers to violations of the laws of nations. And the Genocide Convention is one of the documents which is very significant because it comes immediately after World War II. It is where you have the realization by the civilized world that they had been standing by while people were being massacred in the millions. So the idea was never again. So this document is one of the foundational documents of international human rights law. So you have to go to them and say, this is what's going on. So you can agitate it through different, you know, I understand alien tort claims uh, proceedings are now more complicated than before. But you should be raising this. You should be using procedural ground. You should be using lawfare. Maybe warfare is obviously off the table. But lawfare is very much an option and should be used strategically and intelligently by Pakistan. So you're basically saying that we can and we should look at multiple smaller, relatively narrower and less complicated and more obvious options and use them to build pressure and, and you know, to build a case against India. Absolutely. Because... Right now, the Kashmiri people are, India is trying to silence them. It is trying to take away their voice. We must fight the fights that they can't fight for themselves. So we must raise the concerns that are of direct relevance to them. If they are not being allowed to venture out of their homes, if their communication is shut down, if they're being shot at, what we are witnessing in Kashmir is, as the Guardian put it, the world's first mass blinding, yeah. then we need to agitate that. I okay. mean, this has been written about in multiple international sort of uh, okay. publications. Let, let me take this back to Ambassador Kazi. Ambassador Kazi, sir, you heard uh, Mr. Nakvi. Now, as a very seasoned diplomat, so here's the, here's the legal position and here are the legal options. Now, if this were, these legal options were to be wedded to diplomacy, uh, A, tell me what do you think of these legal options and two, how would then diplomacy play out with reference to these legal options? 
Well, I, well, I think everything that Mr. Nakfi has said is extremely relevant and must be a central part of the overall strategy that Pakistan adopts towards uh, this particular crisis, which has arisen and all. Uh, and so lawfare um, um, uh, is extraordinarily important, but you have to also intensify uh, the diplomatic, uh, um, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, uh, activity um, also because uh, we want to uh, expose even on the political level even on the uh, information level what exactly is happening and now we have uh, for instance the president of uh, Azad Kashmir gave a very specific statement yesterday that uh, Nasal Kushi, ethnic cleansing or effectively genocide, uh, because Nasal Kushi does translate into genocide, uh, it has already begun in Kashmir. Now, of course, we have to be extremely careful that when skeptics listen to this, they want to know whether the facts support such a strong statement. I'm absolutely sure that Masood Khan, being an extraordinarily responsible, intelligent, and able diplomat before he became president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, uh, has, has the necessary information. But these kinds of efforts are going to be essential for us to, over a period of time, uh, shake the conscience of the international community. And and the reason why we should be able to do that is that there's always the specter of possible uh, nuclear uh, conflict in the event India remains A, adamant and totally determined to overcome the resistance no matter what degree of force it has to use in the on the assumption that as a great power at most it will be criticized but it will never be sanctioned uh, and of course they will also play on the credibility of Pakistan and try to refer to uh, various uh, um, you know criticisms of Pakistan that uh, are still there and we face this FATF challenge and we face the and the uh, and the Asia Pacific group you know where India has a lot of influence and all uh, is is already in session um, uh, in uh, Australia, uh, and um, and then there's uh, IMF and its monies, which depends on FATF, as is explicitly um, uh, there in the uh, package. Uh, so Pakistan has to a project its image far more positively, intensify its diplomacy, knock on all doors, have the very finest people. And here, I think, there was a recent column, um, uh, was it in today's or yesterday's paper by Salim Safi, where he'd just been back, been to uh, Azad Kashmir, where the, he encountered a lot of skepticism and disappointment and felt that the Kashmiris, you know, just as, as we say and the world is saying, and Amartya Kumar Sen has eloquently said, that the Kashmiris need to be consulted. How dare India take these steps without Absolutely. any consultation? Absolutely. Uh, but let's, let's go, I go, think going back, go back to uh, what you referred to, um, with reference to uh, Sardar Masood Khan, uh, the president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, the, the alert that's been issued by Genocide Watch, uh, Faisal, this is very important. They say that they are applying Professor Barbara Half's risk factors. Um, and uh, so what are those risk factors? One, prior genocidal massacres and continuing impunity for such killings. Number two, continued armed conflict between India and Pakistan over border areas in Kashmir. Uh, number three, an exclusionary ideology of Hindutva. India as Hindu nation by Modi's ruling BJP. Uh, authoritarian military rule without legal restraints imposed by civilian Indian officials. Uh, rule by a minority military force, Hindus and Sikhs over majority Muslim citizens. Cut off of communications and outside access by internet, media and trade. And finally, the seventh one, widespread violations of basic human rights, torture, rape, two-year detentions without charge, arbitrary arrests and deportations of Muslim political and human rights leaders. So these are the benchmarks that they are using. And then they have further 10 stages of what they call the genocidal process. Uh, which are also far advanced according to the Genocide Watch. Now, my question to you would be, and you've explained it uh, very uh, with great clarity, the options that we have. 
But if heaven forbid this process were to, uh, to go into an advanced stage, we hope not because we are talking about human lives. But if it does, then what options, A, what options does Pakistan have and B, uh, is there then the equivalent of what we call sua moto by a court, by the international community saying, well, this is something that simply cannot, it is not acceptable and, and we are going to take some action with reference to that. Well, look, the international community um, always has the uh, authority to take action and under Article 8 of the Genocide Convention, any contracting party can call upon the competent argument, uh, organs of the United Nations to take such action as they consider appropriate in the circumstances. So, but how do you get there is the question. And the point I think that comes arises from when you talk about genocide watches, Pakistan has, I think in recent years, concentrated on presenting the Kashmir issue itself. So you would have parliamentarians going on trips here and there and saying, you know, oh, you know, I had a meeting on XYZ. We need to engage more with the international human rights sort of ecosystem and use that to present our case. It's far more effective now for us to say, look, Genocide Watch says X rather than we say this. Because if we present it as simply this is Pakistan's opinion, then the answer is some form of what about you from the Indian side. Well, what about what you did here? What about what you... Wait, that's not the issue. The issue is what is India doing to the Kashmiri people? And to look at it from an objective, neutral perspective and say, this is illegal. So you need to engage with the international community. You need to have independent bodies verify what's going on. And you need to have independent bodies lead your case forward. Otherwise, this will, you know, even though the genocide, the, the, the motto behind the genocide convention was never again. But it happens. It happened in Bosnia and Srebrenica. Yeah. It happened in Rwanda. And there is this book which has this title, We Regret to Inform You that we will be killed with our families tomorrow. Yeah. And that's what happened to people. It will happen if we, but for us to stop it, I think we need to continue to engage with the international community. We need to sensitize them and we have had success okay, already. So like, like Amatya Sen has come up with this. There are a number of other uh, international intellectuals, philosophers, thinkers, uh, celebrities, uh, which which are politically active, which have been talking, for instance, of the Palestinian cause and the rest of it. So we should also be approaching them. We should. And presenting them with, with, the, with the facts and all that and garnering their support. We should. We need to engage with these people. Like, as I said, we talked about pellet guns. Well, where are the facts? Are they being brought to international notice? People have written about it, but it hasn't been highlighted by Pakistan till date. Okay. Go to the organizations, have them declared illegal if you can't ask international scholars to opine on it. Uh, before I wrap up, very quickly, uh, back to Ambassador Kazi. Ambassador Kazi, sir, any last thoughts uh, that you might have? Well, very much everything that uh, uh, Mr. Nakvi has said is absolutely essential and we must do that. But I do believe it's almost equally important that uh, the main interlocutor, um, you know, for um, the Kashmiri cause has to be the Kashmiris themselves. Now, for the time being, the Kashmiris in uh, occupied Kashmir are uh, under detention and all kinds of uh, containment, confinement and lockdown and uh, all of that. But there are very able people in Azad Jammu and Kashmir. They may, or not, may, may not be your run of the mill politicians, but there are very able people who are aware of this um, um, uh, situation, I tell you quite honestly, Jaz, much in much more detail than we are, with much greater sensitivity than we are. But the question is that the manner of their presentation abroad should be different from the manner of their presentation to Pakistani audiences Absolutely. or other so-called Desi audiences and all. Ab absolutely. Abroad, so I'm afraid this is the time I have for this segment. Thank you so much. Uh, that was Ambassador Ashraf Jangir Kazi. Thank you, uh, Faisal Hussain Nakwi is going to take a short break and at the other end of the break, we'll continue with our discussion of India-Pakistan situation and also perhaps, as I said in my opening, what is it that the U.S. can do? Stay with us.
welcome back to Indus Special. We continue with our discussion of what kind of strategies should Pakistan adopt in order to put pressure on India. In the earlier segment, we discussed various legal strategies. We'll probably look at those legal strategies again with our new panel of guests. Uh, but also, as I said in the opening, what exactly can President Trump do? Because Recently, that was the third time that he's talked about mediation between India and Pakistan. For this segment, we have with us uh, Reference General Ghulam Mustafa, a former uh, Commander One Corps, uh, Ambassador Ghalib Iqbal, who joins us from Islamabad, and Dr. Zafar Jaspal, who's a professor of international relations and political science at the Qaeda Azam University. Um, General Mustafa, sir, before I come to you, I just want to, and I'm going to ask some, some uh, operational questions because there have been lots of questions about, uh, you know, the uh, line of, across the line of control, fire exchanges and the rest of it. But I just want to get Ambassador Iqbal's take on, uh, on, the, on the sort of legal strategies that we've been talking about uh, in the last couple of days uh, and whether we have the diplomatic tools and wherewithal to actually push those legal strategies? I'm pretty sure that we are in a good position to implement all the decisions which have been, which have been taken by the government. But I feel that there is something which we need to take into consideration, and that is that can we achieve the ultimate objectives we want to? At the moment, it seems a little bit difficult to me because uh, India, what all they did after uh, revoking 370 and 35A and sending additional troops over there, uh, what they have they done is that practically annex the land. And it's an occupied area. It was an occupied area. And it continues to be an occupied area. We need to intensify the diplomatic efforts not on one or two fronts. ICJ is a very good decision. Uh, but we need to go to the Council for the Human Rights in Geneva. We need to, there are over 7,000 UN uh, organizations around the globe. We need to raise hue and cry and we need to raise this issue at all levels and in all the organizations. We can do it at UNESCO, at the UNICEF, all over so that this needs to come out. People should be able to know about it. At present, uh, the Western media has written about it, but they are going to forget about it in another five days, 10 days, 20 days time. So the atrocities which are being committed, that needs to be brought out to everyone wherever it's possible. But we need we need to think of out-of-box solutions at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, I think you know, uh, innovative, probably, solutions, uh, innovative solutions. Innovative solutions. Also, as I did in the previous segment also, uh, for the benefit of the panel here, uh, that Genocide Watch has actually issued a genocide alert uh, for Indian occupied Kashmir. Uh, let me also say, uh, and this is deeply ironic, uh, for a country that considers itself uh, the world's most populous democracy, that Genocide Watch uh, has a genocide alert for occupied Kashmir, and it also has a genocide watch for Indian state of Assam. Uh, and a genocide watch is declared when early warning signs indicate that a genocidal process is underway. Uh, General Mustafa, uh, how do we, if, if, you know, so there's been a lot of fire exchange. There are a lot of questions, questions also about why we are losing soldiers. Of course, we're also targeting civilians. Uh, in the previous round, they also used uh, ammunition uh, that is, banned uh, under, under the convention cluster, cluster yes. uh, munitions. Uh, we've agitated that uh, point also. But give me a sense of how prepared we are in the event that they try some kind of ingress uh, on multiple axes along the line of control. There are two things, uh, Jaz, that uh, we must understand. One is that mountainous terrain is highly troop intensive. Correct. Number two, uh, in the entire range that you know, we're talking about line of control, armor deployment is almost out, barring few uh, places. The third is that in case you want to develop operations on multiple axes, 
you need that kind of uh, in investment in troops and everything else. If that were to be a plan from the Indian side, they would have to denude their resources elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Number two, as of now, there are over a million soldiers there and about a lakh plus in Pakistan. If the Indian were to pull that out and come towards Pakistan, the lid would go off the pressure cooker that is uh, Indian held Kashmir and all hell will break loose and India is going to get into very serious trouble because Kashmir is the way they are now. They are, I think, fed up with life anyway. So why not fight, uh, die fighting? So if they want to get out from the borders, they release the pressure from the pressure cooker. That is where the problem is. Pakistan, on the other hand, has one disadvantage. One is that our line of, uh, around the line of control at three, four places, our line of communications are very close. So that is where Indians target their places. Yeah. The second is, in quite a few places... Particularly in the Neelam Valley. In the Neelam Valley. And a uh, few other places, Indians are on a higher level of ground than we are. As uh, over the years, what we have done is that we have gone as close to line of control as was possible to ensure that that kind of a thing doesn't happen. And knowing the way things are developing, the way they try to do that surgical strike, famous, which was a huge uh, facade, any increase from Indian side, even at the smaller scale, is not likely to succeed in any way. It might, they might succeed initially, but the way people are deployed, the way people have been trained over the years, the way they have been, have been involved in this. I mean, as far as line of control is concerned, it's no more their ceasefire line. We are fighting a war already there. So therefore, I think Pakistan is very happily placed if it comes to that. We are losing casualty. We are suffering casualty. That's fine. And that is going to happen because Pakistan has yet another problem. That our people in Azad, Jammu and Kashmir, and even in Gil, they are working as close to the line of control as is humanly possible. They are right, some places right on the line of control. And on the other hand, what the Indians have done is, they have uh, over a five kilometers plus area Along the line of control, they've got that vacated from the Hindus, if there were any, and they have forced Muslims to be there now. So, I, this, this was a, another question that I wanted to ask you. Do we face a problem in terms of retaliation, uh, given the, the sort of Muslim and civilian population on the other side of the line of control? There's a very huge constraint. There's a very huge constraint, because along the line of control and beyond their side, there are brothers. I mean, it could be my nephew and my son standing there, that side. That's the, how sensitive it is, uh, a point for us. And that is, I think, priority one. All engagement uh, rules that have been laid down over the years, I don't know what are the present one, but I'm sure that can't, you can't change that. That anything that you do, if it hurts a Muslim their side, if it hurts a human being that side, that commander and that team gets to, into trouble. Yeah, so that, there's a problem. So let me go back to Islama Studios and... Um, get uh, Dr. Jaspal in. Uh, Dr. Jaspal, uh, you, you've obviously been monitoring the news reports with reference to the ICJ. Uh, are there any other options that you think Pakistan can exercise? Uh, Ambassador Ghalib Iqbal has also already talked about uh, simultaneously using thousands of UN organs and organizations uh, in order to create a groundswell of opinion against India. Any other options that we might have? I think that uh, first we should not, uh, not forget this International Court of Justice. And here is the minor reference with, as you pointed out, Geneva Watch, a genocide watch with reference to that. If you see, in 2008, there was a famous case which was, you can say, played by one of the Norwegian, I think, uh, lawyer, human rights activist against the Sudani, pres the then president, Omar Bashir, and even Sudan was not a member, and in the absentia there was a verdict against him. So that kind of a thing could be, but there is an other option, of course, as Ambassador Ghalib rightly pointed out, that we should explore and we should contact them, uh, all those 7,000 plus organizations. But there is an other area where we can also focus, that is Kashmiri's diaspora, which is residing in yes. Britain, Good. Europe, or you can say in the United States. And within the Kashmiri diaspora, we should also take into account that in addition to the Kashmiris, if you see within India, all minorities are suffering. And this needs to sensitize directly or indirectly 
on this issue of the Christians who are suffering there, because in the Europe, when you talk about the Muslim, maybe they are not very much uh, attracted. But at the same time, if you talk about the Christian or other communities, which are also suffering in India, the, there's a need to make an alliance sort of thing between the or among the all the minorities in the which are suffering from the Hindutva Rog Raj in India. So that could be another option to plead it, to sensitize the international community, and uh, you can say draw their attention. Because simply saying Muslim or Kashmiris, uh, many, uh, you can say, Europeans, or it's easier for the Indian diaspora to kill, oh, it's an India-Pakistan issue. But if you can, uh, you can say, expand the horizon and highlight the sufferings of the other communities as well, then definitely there will be a difference. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Iqbal, one of the things about the Dara's, uh, the, uh, one of the congressmen, American congressmen, who's actually talked about this, saying that, and he's from the Washington state, and he said that there are people from uh, Jammu and Kashmir uh, in his constituency, and they, some of them have gone there after this uh, communication blackout, and they've come back, and they've actually reported a lot of repression, and therefore, this is something that we are now seized off. So, uh, what uh, Jaspal is saying, with reference to the diasporas, can be a very important ingredient of any policy uh, with reference to building pressure on, uh, on India. See, the problem at the moment is that all the Kashmiris residing abroad and all the Pakistanis residing abroad are looking towards the Pakistan missions. They can look at towards the Pakistan mission for getting the basic data. But they need to go to the congressmen of their area, to MPs of their area, to the members of the lower house, upper house of their area and tell them bluntly that this is our issue and we need to and ensure that the people in occupied Kashmir are not killed, there is no genocide and their human rights violations are stopped forthwith. Otherwise, we are not going to vote for you. They need to be blunt because at the moment what I have seen is that most of the people are discussing it among themselves. They need to go. You need to ensure that the people who are going to get the vote from the diaspora, they are the people who take up your cause, whether under coercion or whether uh, voluntarily. But they need to be pushed. And, they did, and another point I wanted to make was uh, regarding out-of-box solutions. I think we need to encourage uh, a government in exile for uh, occupied Kashmir. It's a very important we thing. need to encourage a government in exile for uh, Khalistan. You need to encourage these things because you need to put pressure on India. And we have been talking about mediation by President Trump. And President Trump has also said it a number of times, in fact three times, that I'm going to talk because both the leaders of the countries are my friends and I'm going to talk to them and we are going to discuss it and we'll try to sort it out. But in, in my opinion, uh, the mediation uh, offer by President Trump is just like a homeopath medicine. If it doesn't oh, yeah. benefit oh, yeah. you, it's not going to harm you either. So we should just look at it that way. And nothing beyond that. I think, I think that's a, that's I a, doubt very, it very much. That that's, a very appropriate, that's a very appropriate <laughs> term. Now, Ambassador Iqbal has won this, this term was absolutely appropriate. Secondly, this government in exile. I think this is a this is an idea that needs to be uh, you know taken up, thought about, and perhaps presented. Well, taking advantage of this situation now that we have uh, Walid Sahab around with us, I'm sure it has been done. But have we established a crisis center in our foreign office where we have all the stakeholders, including the army, including your uh, economy, including your law, because. This case, when you take it anywhere, is a multidimensional case. Like you're talking about the law side and the military side and everything else. Those things and documented. That kind of a document must go out to all our embassies and all our people who are there. Because that is what will give them basic, because everybody must be on the same page as we're talking about. So that they can talk on those points. That will also give a kind of a Pakistan's policy on the subject. The second thing that I wish to highlight here is that all our embassies, regardless of whether the country talks to us, whether we have good relations with them or not, they must be taken on board and the university must be approached. If you recall, in 1971, 
as early as first week of April, we were fearful that uh, Bangladesh is going to be established somewhere as a government and the world community will start uh, recognizing it. Some places were mentioned in uh, within the uh, what is now Bangladesh. And we were forced, I mean, we had to go beyond our normal speed limit to get those areas cleared so that that doesn't happen. Now, that's the kind of pressure it can put. It's a very good idea. Government in exile must be established. I'm sure Kashmir ki, Khalistan and other whatever. And Dalits, I mean, yeah, uh, Dalits. The other day, Dalits took out probably the largest demonstration against the Indian atrocity was happening with them. That must be absolutely, should be done. Look, otherwise, so, this so, so essentially, essentially, uh, two things. One, that there are the government departments and organizations uh, that are going to work because that's their job, but also to create uh, a group which interacts, yes. uh, which are outside experts. You don't have to pay no, them, yes. you don't have to give them anything, no. but you draw on their expertise. So whether it is, you know, legal minds, policy wonks, people who can, so, you know, it's like, uh, essentially exchange of ideas. I mean, you keep throwing the ideas. Precisely. At the end of the day, you start noting down what has come up. Uh, precisely. And secondly, to uh, check all the boxes in terms of India's fault lines. Yes. Whether those are like the Dalit fault lines. As I said, Assam. Yes. I mean, there's a yes. genocide watch on Assam. Can I say a word on that? Sure, sure. Assam issue is when the Indians brought all the Bengalis this side. Absolutely. And uh, they thought that they would be and they were used against us. The kind of atrocities committed on those people in 1971, starting onwards, they are actually becoming a very serious danger to the Indians. Yeah. And that must be a very, very important, because Pakistan has links and emotional links with those people. And those people, and I can vouch for you, because our coachmen, they are now very clear that Bangladesh and Indian relationship can't go together. That's why Indian, Bangladesh these are, these, are, uh, these are former officers from Pakistan, Pakistan military, yes. military Academy. Yes, yes. Who were commissioned in the Pakistan, in Pakistan Army. Army. And, yeah. Ah, yes. yeah. One more thing. One united front. Pakistan, Kashmir is together. And one more thing that we must be aware of is that using the environments of Britain that they are conducive to what the Indians are doing, they have created a group which has started talking of a third option. And that is a kind of an option which becomes very attractive without people realizing what are the implications of it. And those are the people who actually are going to confront uh, our Kashmiri brothers and sisters who are putting across their points. That is also a point that we need to combat and very vigorously. Uh, so uh, back to uh, Dr. Jaspal. Uh, Dr. Jaspal, so government in exile, uh, you, you talked about other options also. So I'm assuming that what we are saying here is that it's not a sequential, uh, you know, offensive, but we need to simultaneously work on various options. Is that sense correct? I think that you sounds very correct because we have to not forget that the Kashmir issue is not a, uh, you can say, going to resolve overnightly. In India, when the Modi government took this decision to, you can say, abrogate 370 article, if you see within India, it is a very much popular move because 83 persons are Hindu or Hindutva's followers are very much, you can say, happy. Now here, if we have a sustained approach, then definitely out of the box and the multiple options we should utilize. So that's why we have to be very careful and we have to draw a short term come to long term strategy in this context. And one is this, how to sensitize the different communities. As you pointed out or earlier, it was mentioned by the ambassador that a government's in exile. So if you have a government in exile, at least they are every day sounding there. These governments are, let's say, some kind of a shadow government. So in that context, that makes a lot of sense. And then of of course, engaging more and more. And in this thing, if you can, uh, I think you are aware that in even in Britain, no more than 40, uh, say you can say, members of the House of Commons constituencies where the Kashmiris have a great influence. So if they start, uh, you can say, contacting their MPs and definitely approaching these, then their voice will be start hearing or raising within the House of Commons or as has happened today in the Senate of the United States. So these, these are very much options. We should go it and we can have a sustained policy over it. It, not, it shouldn't be like this that, okay, 
we have a for one day or for one week or for two weeks because we understand international media or every media has to go after the stories but if you have a, this kind of a sustained movement then they are definitely picking up and sustaining the argument and then people gradually become sensitized or what we call a scrutize and as a result there will be a, some dividends absolutely and i also wrap up unfortunately this is all the time that i have but i think uh, uh mustafa that the important thing is that it's not about uh, a sudden burst and then uh, a long gap and then a sudden burst. It's got to be constant, sustained, constant, constant, sustained pressure uh, in order for this to, to uh, work. So thank you so much, Ambassador Ghalib Iqbal, General Ghulam Mustafa, Dr. Zafar Nawaz, Jaspal. This is all we have today from Indus Special. We shall see you tomorrow. Until then, it's goodbye.